Watch this. It's Friday. You know what that means. It's time to wrap up the week. Here's what we're talking about. Over at the State House, yes, budgets being passed. We're talking about the Joint Finance and Appropriations Committee, who usually doesn't make headlines, but when you fight over how to get your job done behind closed doors, yeah, it's going to get people talking. So, yes, we'll see what they did on budgets. JFAC wasn't the only thing on the legislative agenda this week. How could it be? We talked about nine other bills this week, including one about license plates, which a lot of you had a lot to say about. We're going to tell you where that legislation is, and we've got your comments from the week. And I'm not the only one celebrating a birthday today. That's right, it's my birthday. CUNA High School is turning 100 years old, and they had a big birthday bash to bring in the centennial. No, I'm not 100 years old, but... We will get to the news right now. Oh, what a week. Thanks for being here to wrap it all up with us. As you might have followed with us every day, Monday through Friday, we have followed the debate centered on how Idaho lawmakers should do budgets for the state. Two competing camps for weeks and sort of boiled over yesterday. But today, we got a strong indication that lawmakers will stick with the new process of passing maintenance budgets. So this new process we've talked about, it involves the budgeting committee, JFAC, passing these maintenance budgets that are meant to be the base needs for an agency budget. And then the full budget process continues later on in the session with lawmakers circling back to take up supplemental requests, line items, and replacements in budgets. So critics of the new process say that the maintenance budgets, they are not that at all, but instead stripped down with not even enough money to keep the lights on. So there's concern that lawmakers also won't go back and take up supplemental requests, thus shortchanging budgets, just having the maintenance budget. Lawmakers say they won't cover everything that these agencies need. But lawmakers had a collection of maintenance budgets to approve or vote down this morning, giving us an indication on where the budgets are headed for the rest of the year. It's been a week of budget traffic. House come to order. Debates on the process Idaho's JFAC committee should use to set budgets. The third reading of bills and joint resolutions. The stop and start week rolled through the finish line with green lights. Appropriations bill providing maintenance adjustments. Question is to House Bill 458, pass the House. Appropriations bill providing maintenance adjustments. House Bill 459, pass the House. This is the maintenance budget for the legislative branch. So House Bill 475 passed the House. And one budget kind of served as a microcosm of the week. This is the fiscal year 2025 maintenance budget for the public school support program. Lawmakers crushed through a collection of maintenance budgets Friday morning, almost all passing by convincing party line margins. Still, debate echoes concerns about the process itself. Some speaking out about the process they perceive. I cannot turn my head and vote green and allow the Appropriations Committee to be a policy committee. And that's what I think is happening with this particular budget. Um, we're, we're tinkering with non-discretionary funds that are set in statute, and that is not the role of Appropriations Committee. Thank you. If this bill hits the desk of the gentleman on the second floor, um, uh, and the second follow-up bill does not hit until after the signing deadline, uh, the, the time he has to sign this bill, this bill becomes the state education budget. There is no guarantee that a second bill, no one in this body can guarantee that a second bill will hit the governor's desk or what might be in that bill. But there are concerns that the co-chair of JFAC, Representative Wendy Horman, is happy to answer. As she explains, the education maintenance budget does have increases already built in. They're at $263 million more right now with fewer students than they were last year at this time. There will be additional funding coming in a future bill, but the reason they don't have all their money yet is because it's February and not all the checks have been sent to the districts yet. And rest assured, you'll be seeing more budgets in the future pertaining to public schools, and this body will get to decide on them then. It seems a major word this all boils down to, trust, or maybe lack thereof. I hear about trusting the process. I cannot trust a process that has never existed before, has never been tried, <clears throat> and has such monumental impact as a result. So for me, I cannot vote for this bill. 
uh, and I cannot trust a process that hasn't been proven to be uh, a, a good, sound process. So we've heard from the critics throughout the week, and I just want to mention a conversation I had with both co-chairs of JFAC, Representative Wendy Horman and Senator Scott Grow. And both of them acknowledged to me, really, from the beginning of the session, that they understand some of the trepidation with trying out a new system, but they say that these concerns about not circling back to supplemental items, it's unfounded. And they believe that they really will, of course, have these meetings that Wendy Horman tells me are already scheduled on the JFAC calendar. So we'll keep a close eye on this. There are people that are concerned, but the JFAC co-chair say, let us work and let us do the process. So all we can do is watch. Okay, other than the JFAC jumbo, we talked about a long list of legislation this week. So let's take a look at a lot of the things that we covered right now. And of course, this week we focused on nine different bills, including four in the Senate. That involves child safety filters on smart devices, mandatory election guides, campaign donation reporting, and expanding contraception to six-month prescription in Idaho. We also covered five bills in the Idaho House, and that includes expanding the license plate expiration date, artificial intelligence deep fakes in elections, gender definitions, adding fentanyl to the mandatory minimum sentence, and cannibalism. Yep. So what's going on with all the legislation? Well, on Fridays, we like to tell you all about it in a legislative wrap. The bill would add significant complexity for businesses and would create additional confusion at the point of purchase. Monday, we did a quick and dirty Senate committee wrap, starting with Senate Bill 1253, requiring smartphone and tablet manufacturers to turn on the existing filters at activation for Idaho's kids, but only for browsers and search engines. This is so kids can't access inappropriate content like pornography. But something we've heard before, parents want to decide for themselves what's best. Senate Bill 1253 was passed with a due pass recommendation. It's currently waiting for its third reading. And everybody else, everybody would be treated the same for campaign finance contributions. Senator Scott Herndon wants to change Idaho law, so any election donation dollar amount needs to have a name attached to it. Current law says that donations less than $50 can go anonymous, but Senate Bill 1218 would change that. Some say they already report every dollar they get, so this isn't necessary. Senate Bill 1218, it passed committee, but failed on the Senate floor 12 to 22 with one lawmaker absent. So for now, it appears it's dead. It turns out Idaho lawmakers do listen to Boise State's public policy survey. The most well-received question on the public's policy survey this year was voters saying they would like a voter guide. That's right. Senate Bill 1273 would require the Secretary of State's office to make a voter guide for primary and general elections. The bill is currently in the Senate State Affairs Committee. Monday, we also talked about House Bill 413, which eliminates the requirement to replace your license plate every 10 years, just as long as those plates are still reflective and readable at 75 feet away, which would save taxpayers more than a million dollars per year. House Bill 413 passed the House almost unanimously. I wish Representative Birch was here so we could tease him. The bill is currently in the Senate Transportation Committee, and we know what you're thinking. Yes, county designators will stay on license plates. Maybe fifth time's the charm for Senate Bill 1234, proposing to regulate insurance companies so they reimburse a six-month period of birth control at a time instead of just three. And so the most effective way to reduce abortion rates is to prevent unintended pregnancy. Senate Bill 1234 passed the Senate, 19 to 16, and is now headed to the House. Well, this doesn't do anything to make anybody's life any better. It only harms. Representative Julianne Young's House Bill 421, proposing to make the word gender mean the same as sex when referring to male or female, it passed the House on Wednesday and is now in the Idaho Senate State Affairs Committee. The controversial House Bill 406 is just 18 yay votes away from the governor's desk. The bill adds fentanyl to the list of drugs in Idaho that carry a mandatory minimum sentence. And it creates the crime of drug-induced homicide, which means if you give anyone a Schedule One drug, and that includes heroin or cocaine or fentanyl, and it kills that person, even if it's an accident, the bill wants to prosecute a homicide. Drug trafficking and human trafficking are interconnected. That ultimately will be the individuals that will be penalized. If they're a victim, they're a victim. Harsh reality is if you don't do that, they stay out there until either they die or they kill someone else. The Senate Judiciary and Rules Committee passed the bill to the Senate floor just yesterday with a due pass recommendation for the whole body. RS 31078, cannibalism. Yep, you heard it. 
Representative Heather Scott is proposing to add a line to the law already banning cannibalism that says, anyone who willfully provides said flesh and blood to another person to ingest without that person's knowledge or consent is also guilty of cannibalism. Representative Scott doesn't want human composting in Idaho, but also proposed the bill because she saw part of the food show claiming to have fed judges human flesh without their knowledge. Thing is, it was a prank show. It's Davis Bade's new prank show. <laughs> the bill is referred to the House Judiciary Rules and Administration for Printing. And that's a legislative wrap. So the cannibalism conversation generated a lot of text messages into our text line. We had a lot of conversations. So we wanted to spend a lot of extra time here to show some of the best comments that came in. And we'll just go through some of these at random. We'll start with this one from Jay in regards to Scott's concern about cannibalism. What about people who spread their loved ones ashes? I know many people who have spread ashes in the wilderness. What about that? How is this any different? Good question. Kelly said, OMG, do you think Heather Scott is a prime example of people who fall for internet scams? OMG, Wade Idaho is famous for finger sticks. We are, fa oh wow, finger sticks, that, that's a new connotation. Then Kim in Eagle said, re cannibalism, what? No, seriously. What? Yeah, it's not something we talk about every day, cannibalism. And finally, Dale isn't the only one who referenced Silence of the Lambs. He says, Hello, Clarice, that's a beautiful perfume. Would you like to stay for dinner? I didn't do the voice well, that's fine. Anyways, we thought it was funny too, uh, but it shows you there's a lot of conversations that happen at the Capitol. What would you do without county indicators on license plates? Well, don't worry, there isn't any legislation getting rid of that, but there were a lot of you quick to point fingers at the worst drivers when we talked about some driving legislation, including our very own Brian Holmes. Who do you think are the worst drivers in the state? I don't know, let's just throw that question out there. This could be interesting. Tell us about it or really anything that the show touches on or anything on your mind. Our number is 208-321-5614, and you can text that number with your name and hashtag the 208 with your comment, whatever. We'll get to all of these responses and messages coming up at the end of the show. Okay, we talked about driving just before the break and I'm getting a flood of text messages about where you think the worst drivers are, so keep them coming. But with that license plate legislation that we did talk about this week, we just had to dig up a gem from John Miller who explains it all. It's today's 208 Redial. You don't have to look far in Idaho to realize we're free to be gaga over our cute cars and sports teams. Whether they win the series or not. But the big story isn't who or what, but how many. How many plates do we have? 11 in all. The DOT's Mike Vogel gave us the quick and dirty about what's new and what's not in Idaho's long love affair 
with license plates. And like we're sitting here talking and just minutes ago, out comes another one. Yes, yeah, we've just had the new agriculture plate. For all you farmers, the latest in a bumper crop of trees and wilderness, not to mention the ISU, BSU and UI plates, each serving its own cause. If you buy a snowmobile plate, it helps snowmobilers. If right. you're buying a ski plate, it helps skiing and cross country trails. The youth plate will be out next month. This will be a popular one. I was here six years ago and there were like three, I think. Right, there were only three. This one, this one, and this one. If you thought about maybe getting a new one branching out from the bluebird plate. Oh, I got a brand new one I'm going to go get. I'll be the first one in the state to get it. It's what is the it? sawtooth plate. Yeah, it's a bighorn sheep and you got the sawtooths, of course. Right. People are already lining up, but Betty Oaf remembers times of simpler tags. Oh man, I was born in 36. Mine's right up there. And you can see some of the themes have changed. Famous Potatoes has been a consistent theme throughout. Back in the 40s, they even came with a pat of butter. Why? I just guess we like them. <laughs> you never know what the DOT is going to serve up next. That's right. How about sour cream and chives? That'd be nice, wouldn't it? John Miller, Idaho's News Channel 7. So, county indicators have been important for license plates for a long time here in Idaho, and we made sure that the license plate bill is keeping the indicators in there. Although crossed out, the indicators are in Idaho law in multiple places. So you would have to create a whole new piece of specific legislation to get rid of all the indicators altogether. But according to Brian Holmes, there are really needed for defensive driving. You know, that's the point where you go, how do we tell the difference between a car from the 2C with Canyon County versus Ada County, which is 1A? I mean, other than their inability to drive? So Brian's hot take, it got a lot of you hot-headed or other people really agreed. See, we take everyone's comments, even Brian's. But anyway, Lauren Boise said, thanks for a laugh today. I gave my husband the same 2C driver ribbing when we were dating. We lived in Nampa at the time. Or Scott, who said, too bad. I was hoping that the county designator would be eliminated so I can go to northern Idaho and not get my car key due to my 1A plate. Gail in Canyon County was offended, saying, shame on you for making fun of 2C drivers, of which I am one. Never a ticket or a wreck or dirty hand gesture from other drivers. You must be talking about 1A. And Curtin Boyce, he said, don't forget 2T. Ah. And we knew it was going to go here. Becky said, don't disparage the 2C, but disparaging Californians is cool. Is it? I don't know. I'm going to stay out of this one. The text message line is very hot. But if you didn't get your, your county hit in, send it in, 208-321-5614. Include your name and hashtag the 208. We'll give you credit, and we'll get to some of these messages at the end of the show.
I love the slow-mo snow videos. So beautiful, so peaceful looking. And if you are a lover of the snow, Bad news is that we're not expecting more this weekend, and if you're not, I guess it's good news that we're expecting more sunshine and some warmer conditions, but we got to wait a little while for that warm-up. So we've got more sunshine throughout the weekend, and we will see some clouds drift through at times, depending on where you are. We'll also see some more of those breezy conditions similar to today, to today so that may make you feel a little bit colder. But as I mentioned, that warm-up will be taking effect. We'll see a little degree or two increase as we go day-to-day -day for about the next week, so continuing to warm up as we go throughout the week tonight though we will be getting colder. You can see that the clouds are expected to clear as we get into later tonight. Temperatures close to freezing by 10 o'clock and for tomorrow morning quite cold lows in the 20s across those valleys. But then check this out sunshine as we go into tomorrow as those highs are expected to be in the lower end of the 40s. As we look across the region Treasure Valley expected to see a little bit more sunshine than a couple other spots. Magic Valley we've got the clouds mainly on Saturday and then opposite for the mountains where they're seeing mainly the clouds on Sunday and some of those light showers are still out there right now. However, they look to be quite light and spotty as that low pressure continues to track off to the east. And that's mainly it for our precipitation. We do have a little bit more of those chances as we go into uh, Monday uh, favoring some of the northern zones, but pretty dry for the weekend. Tomorrow, though, I, I mentioned the low temperature is quite chilly for us, and we have the lows to close to 30 in those valley locations today. So another chilly day, chilly start for us, and you can see all the way down uh, to one is expected to get over in Stanley and Magic Valley areas expected to be in the 20s. Overall, looking at your seven day forecast, there's not any one day where I foresee uh, a lot of issues weather wise, but you can see just that gradual warm up as we go into the end of the week. One Today's Valentine's Day, by the way, in case you needed a reminder, but you can see some of those 50s coming back into the picture by the end of your seven day forecast. In the early 1900s, the city of CUNA was just a few years old with fewer than 400 people. But those people had kids, and those kids, well, they needed to learn. Like the very first school was in a tent, which I thought was kind of weird. So it was like, how is that even possible? They eventually built brick versions, but it wasn't long before they needed one just for the big kids. So CUNA held a bond election to pay for it. And at first, it failed, since they couldn't decide where to put it. But a second try would produce the money to build a $40,000 high school building downtown, which was dedicated in February of 1924. There was only 14 in the entire graduating class. And you're graduating this year? Yes. And how many are you graduating with? We have over 400. We have close to 409. It's our biggest class um, ever. And the biggest class ever celebrated their centennial today. Although the school didn't technically open until the spring, CUNA High School's principal, Dave Beamer, says that they're going to celebrate all the way into next fall. Celebrations kicked off today with an assembly, and it will culminate in the homecoming dance for the football season coming up in the fall. But the students weren't the only one in attendance. CUNA hosted very important alumni, too. Our oldest graduate here is 100 years old. She graduated in 1942, so this is really unique to have somebody like that, so we're pretty proud of that. So her name is Bonnie Jerome Compton, so if you're a former or current CUNA caveman, congratulations on 100 years. There's just a flood of comments coming in, so we will get to these as many as we can after the break.
All right, let's get to some of your comments from the program today. This person says, happy birthday, Joe. Yes, Scott, thank you. Everybody who sent your messages in, I saw all of them. I'll try to respond to everyone. Uh, it's, it's been really special to spend my 30th birthday here with you on the 208, so appreciate it. Uh, getting to see your other comments, person says, cannibalism, I'll have to chew on that for a while. And it's Walt from Nampa. Thank you, Walt. Uh, I'm looking forward to the Idaho cannibalism license plate. Thanks, Heather Scott from Blanchard. That's from Deb. Uh, this person says, Gem County. So in addition to the birthday messages, all of you sent in your least favorite driver. So Gem County is from that person. This person says, my husband's driver manager said, when a driver cuts you off, make sure you have all five fingers in the wave. That is a special wave better than the one finger salute. Uh, anyone who speeds up to close a gap when you turn on a turn signal, that, that's a good point, Paul. I like that in terms of the, the driving context. Uh, 6B, which I have to look up. Which one is 6B? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. 6B is Boise, okay. Boise County is the absolute worst, followed closely by V. They both are parking horribly and always cutting people off in a huge hurry to get to the same stoplight as me. Okay, so that is good. Uh, it froze, here we go. This person says, after living in Idaho all my life, every state but Alaska. Okay, uh, this person says, it's a tie between everyone born in the 208 area code. All right, thanks everyone. Appreciate the messages. We'll see you next week. <laughs>